Um, hi, everybody. Um, thanks, uh, the guys and girls from Reich, for letting me speak here. We didn't know each other before. Uh, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm Pavel Přibyl uh, from Salsita, and now uh, that we know each other, I already really like them <laughs> because they let me in. Uh, so far, I was talking only on the street and in the parks, you know, and now <laughs> first time under the roof with uh, real people. Um, yeah, and we kind of find out that our topics are similar, so they let me in for their great meetup. So I'll be talking about uh, social intelligence and how you can use it uh, to improve your testing and to get more time and stuff. We'll see. Um, yeah, I work as a QA lead. I have uh, like 10 people under me, so the scales are a little bit lo lower than in RAG. They have more people, but uh, I still think that the things can be applied to bigger companies as well. Uh, so, uh, I'm really a fan of uh, modern testing principles. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, they are kind of evolution or extension of the agile testing. And uh, they were formed by like Ellen Page and Brent Jason. They have a great podcast. I highly recommend it. And a lot of ideas that I will present here come from these guys and from their podcast and their uh, pages. Um, so the basic ideas, at least those that are uh, relevant to this talk, are that testers should do less testing, which is awesome, right? We want to do it. Developers should do actually more testing, which well, it would be also great. But there is a catch. Uh, we as the testers should uh, coach and educate them uh, and uh, <laughs> teach them how to test and why it's important. But in the, in the long run, we will have more time and we can focus on the bigger picture. Uh, let's start with an example to demonstrate this, what I'm talking about. Like, uh, if you are supposed to test an elevator, you know, you probably heard this exercise. Some, some of you may probably uh, face it during your interview for a tester. So, I guess you have a lot of ideas how to test an elevator. I already also find some web pages that uh, are like hints for a QA interview, and they give you a lot of examples how to test an elevator. Some guys are crazy, you know, they can do uh, like uh, incredible things with it that you were never thought about. Uh, so, you know, like pressing buttons, like uh, will it go to seventh floor if you press button seven and stuff like that, which is kind of, well, you can figure it out. But your amazing uh, testing uh, mind is made for bigger things, I believe. So for me, Testing an elevator would be more like testing the utilization, how it works, run some simulations, uh, simulate a building with 1,000 people and how the elevator will perform. If you tweak some statistics, if you tweak some maximal weight or the speed or how fast the door close and do more in interesting stuff like this, you know, run some models, do data analysis performance testing, of course. So this is where I see modern QA to be, not pressing buttons. Um, yeah, this is um, how I see like the overall quality of the product is influenced by the three main streams, let's say. Um, one of them is the obvious one, the code, which is, uh, I'll stand right here, like produced by the developers, right? Uh, then there are the processes in the company, like including release process, um, like how often do you deliver, how, how often do you uh, release, I mean. And then there is the whole business, like what is the idea of your product, like how does it serve your customers, what value, value does it bring to your customers, and all the things matter, and all the things contribute to the quality of the product. And uh, we are kind of used to test the code, you know, find the bugs there, the developers produce, but I believe that we should have, the, as I said, the bigger picture. We should also check the processes, although some, some may object, okay, this is a thing for um, pro, uh, project mas uh, managers and scrum masters, you know, agile, uh, agile scrum masters, but, you know, as developers, there are also people, they can also produce bugs, they can also do bad decisions, and there should be somebody who's checking those as well. We should be focusing on the bottlenecks of the process, uh, like search for um, inefficiency and uh, where the process uh, has a frictions and stuff like that. 
And also, we should understand the business and the business cases. We should be able, for example, in case of a web application, to understand how the users use it, you know, understand, for example, Google Analytics, see where the real value is. Sometimes it may not uh, be compatible with what uh, business analysts see as a most important feature, for example. So we may be able to, um, we should be able to uh, make our point and say, you know, based on these data, I believe that this feature is more important. Now, of course, like, I don't have time for this, you know. Uh, it's a excuse, well, not excuse, it's a fact <laughs> that I hear a lot. So, um, because, you know, you need to test everything that the developers produce and you need to check all the bug fixes, you need to fix automated tests and write the new ones. And this is exactly the part that I believe we don't have to do. <laughs> if you build a major quality um, in your company and if you trust the developers, enough and I'm perfectly fine in our company with some of the developers when they said it's tested that it's tested I don't have to check it I can I can do something more useful so um, I will tell you a secret like there is a tool that can save you a lot of time and it's quite popular it's used by billion users and it's free and now you will hate me because it's talking to each other and, and now you say like, oh, come on, this will be another, like this motivational uh, speech, you know, that people should talk each other and love each other. But uh, I really think it's <laughs> simple yet important and some, sometimes we forget about it, you know. In the hunt for artificial intelligence, we cannot forget about the social intelligence. And so I will give you some examples what we are doing, uh, how just simple talk and uh, asking the right questions help us to save uh, some time. So you probably, um, well, I cannot judge because I don't know where you work, but in our company I have this problem that we usually did what we call this developer QA ping pong. You know, developer finish some task, put it to a uh, testing column or whatever, I check it, you know, there is no description, nothing, so I give it back and ask him for more clarification. Then he said, okay, it's done, it's, it should work like this. I check it, it wasn't working like this. So I give it back again, and he said, okay, now I fixed it. Um, uh, I <laughs> give it back, no, you didn't. So, and we were pinging like this for two days, three days, because we were, or he was working on something else, and he was disturbed by this. So we just agreed that we will do those um, pair sessions with developers. We call them like handover sessions where we just sit together. I know I have an advantage that our company is quite small and we are all under one roof. Uh, so I can really physically go to the developer and talk with him. But uh, I still believe that it's manageable even on the remote uh, uh, like relationships, although they are more complicated, right? That's, um, uh, that's true, but, but still. Um, so how does it work? Uh, I think the most important thing uh, in general in Agile is to do it in small steps, small increments, see if it works, if it works, continue doing it and add something more. So it didn't work if I just go to the developer and say, hey, now I will sit with you and you will show me how you write unit test and now you show, show me how you test it and everything. It should be like first approach, agree on some time that will be uh, like good for both of you, usually like after lunch before you start to do something uh, interesting. Uh, or uh, in the morning when he grabs his coffee and he has like 20 minutes, sit with him, ask him like, uh, okay, here, ticket, you said it's done. Can you show me how it works? Can you show me on your PC or on your whatever, <laughs> um, on your computer? And immediately, it, it happens quite a lot of time that we found a bug while he was presenting it to me. So he cannot say like, it works on my machine because it obviously didn't. In the same time, he has all the data, like he was checking the logs, he has everything in his system, so he saves quite a lot of time by, by even this. Um, then you can add more, like you can ask him, how did you test it? And he was like, well, well me, like, it's, it's your job, right? And then I said, no, 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 let's turn it around. You are supposed to test it, I'm here to help you, like ask me whatever you want, ask me what, uh, what testing you would imagine, you know, and by the dialogue, we, and then I show him, for example, how to test it, show him some tips. We even run the automated framework on his uh, machine and uh, we write some, uh, some automated tests. 
together and, and really like evolved to a, to a point where really some developers are so great now that, oh, come on. <laughs> come on, some developer plug it out from the circuit. Um, yeah. So they helped me with the testing and now I really trust them that they are able to test, they are able to write unit tests and they are able to write even like UI end-to-end -end test. And at the same time I was uh, like learning from them how, how the JavaScript thing uh, work, why uh, and where to put the unit test. So I'm helping in, and learning in the same time, okay. Another situation, stand-ups. I guess everybody knows it. At least you heard about it. And for many people, this is like the most uh, annoying part of the day where you have to stand there. I call some people like stand-up zombies that um, really stand there and okay, yesterday I was working on data monitor, today I'm working on data monitor, not blocked. And this uh, repeats this <laughs> like every day over and over again and you get nothing from it, right? You can see that he's working on, uh, on data monitor because it's in progress and it's his name there, but I don't have to go there and stand there for like 10 minutes. But you know, ask, and, and usually the saddest thing is that I look around on the other people and they are like, okay, okay, yeah, that's fine. And nobody, even like the, the scrum master or the project manager ask like something like, what does it mean? Or what's, uh, what is left to be done in order, like what's the one thing you need to do in order to finish your task? And sometimes by this simple question, you get surprising answers. Sometimes you find out that he's working on something that is already done uh, differently and better in some third party library or something. Or some, sometimes uh, he's working on something that another guy from another team in your company already solved. So just utilizing those discussions by asking simple questions. And um, the same is with retrospectives. That should be like the key point of the whole like sprint that should, that should uh, support the the, as I said, like the increments, the, the improvement that is like key thing in the agile. You should try something then on the retrospective, evaluate it and see like this, this is where we are heading, this uh, we will do, this we won't do. But usually it's like about just people complaining what went wrong, but, or somebody was like, life is good, yeah, everything is perfect, and, but you get nothing of it. Uh, at least uh, it's good when you, when you check the last retrospective and see if you somehow uh, made some action points and you are following them. But again, like asking like, what are top five problems or how does the list of top five problems looks like this week? So you can, you can either in your mind or probably in some physical form or uh, create like top five problems that are actually troubling you. You can, you can talk about them, like why does you have so many bugs in production? What should we try to, to eliminate this? Like should we focus more on testing? Should we refocus more on unit testing? How can QA help you? And each week try to take a look on this list and see how the order of the, of the items is changing. So tools like this, think about small change, you don't stuck into the routine and think you know, how asking some questions can, can help you. Um, yeah, and uh, this whole thing is about like finding the common language with the developers and both like literally um, like talking to them as I said, but also we were, we were uh, kind of dealing with what the language, like programming language to use. Uh, we were like at the development at Salsita is in JavaScript, we write mobile and web application purely in JavaScript and we were for a long time using Python for testing, from, for the UI testing Python and Selenium. And I love Python, I would use it for everything. I'm really sorry that uh, browsers now support more JavaScript than Python. Uh, so I was defending Python for years, like, oh, we can do everything in Python, we don't have to switch to JavaScript, I don't need this async await thing, you know, I want to click on the button after it's found, not before. And, um, but uh, suddenly more and more I'm coming to conclusion, and we already come to the conclusion that we need to automate in JavaScript as well. Because as I said, uh, removing the friction is one of the roles of the QA and, um, and the, the friction between JavaScript and Python was like uh, the, the problem between developers and QA because we already heard excuses like I don't want to update your test, I don't want to write your test because it's Python. It's, and you can explain them many times that it doesn't matter, but, uh, but yeah. It was a problem, we need to eliminate it. We kind of agreed that we will switch to JavaScript. 
But uh, on the same time, now you can, you can gain much more from the JavaScript API from the browser, so it kind of makes sense to use JavaScript as the one language. And one case that kind of forced me to switch from Python to JavaScript, even though I was like the biggest advocate of it in the company, was this um, case where we were trying to automate a Stripe uh, form. Do you know Stripe, somebody? How do you? Ah, awesome. Maybe you got this problem as well. I, well, let's see. Uh, it's, uh, it's a third-party service for uh, credit card payments. It's uh, like integrated in iframe, iframe, sorry, in the web page. And we were trying to um, fill simple input field, right? That's, that's what Selenium does. Uh, so I write some, something like this in Python, like find the element and put this uh, keys into it. Just a second, sorry. Yeah, you got a time to memorize those numbers, right? Um, but what happened? It was it was felt in some weird order. And I said, okay, I saw it before. Um, you are probably typing it too fast. Let's put some timeouts before the keystrokes or something. I tried a lot of things. Like I tried it for a week. I tried even, and and now you get into where you need to switch from Python to JavaScript. You can execute JavaScript from Python, right? You know, driver execute script, and you can set value of the input field. But it still didn't work because the form, which wasn't controlled by us, was had some weird logic of like event and and you know, whatever. This is the JavaScript that I still don't understand that much. <laughs> but we find we we end up with something like this, uh, where we really have to have like big JavaScript chunk of code inside the Python code, and I said, like, no way, this, this is not... Uh, but this, it was really the wor only working solution, and I said, okay, let's switch to the JavaScript completely, because <laughs> when, I, when I'm using something I don't understand, I, I'm not, uh, I don't feel really well about this. So, yeah, we switched to JavaScript, and now we are using Cypress mostly and WebDriver IO, and uh, we see Incre like incredible increase of the development uh, attention to the to the end-to-end -end test, and now they are really writing, especially Cypress. I don't know why, but you know the developers really love it. Well, I like it too, but I didn't expect as much enthusiasm from the developer side. Uh, so now they really are writing even the UI test, and they are trying experiments like code coverage with it, uh, and they are really into it. And if you, if somebody uh, followed the latest React conf, there were a lot of speeches from developers about Cypress. So it's really a uh, good thing to follow, and I'm glad we did it. So far, it really works. And that's probably all. Yeah, I, I promise, guys, that I will say some case where those principles doesn't work. So if I still have time, I don't know. I didn't follow it. Um, as I said, we are an agency. So we work for different clients, right? And there are some clients that are perfectly okay with whatever we do. They are only interested in the result. So they don't care, they don't care about our processes. They are just happy when they receive the final application. But then there are bigger clients like corporations and they need to control everything and they will tell you how much time you can spend on this, how uh, you need to report everything, you need to create some Excel ch uh, charts and they, they are not really that uh, interested in some modern uh, approaches, even though, though you still um, tell them that it's better for them, that if we try this, it will be, it will be faster and cheaper, but they just want their reports. So uh, now that we make peace with developers and are on one wave, we need to a little bit fight on the customer side. But so far, it's working on most, on most, uh, in most cases. So yeah, that's everything for me, and thank you. And Enjoy the rest of the Thank day. you. Thank you for the great talk.